Section 12 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Geller. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 12. The Dragon's Teeth. Part 2. Telephassa and Cadmus were now pursuing their weary way, with no companion but each other. The queen leaned heavily upon her son's arm, and could walk only a few miles a day. But for all her weakness and weariness, she would not be persuaded to give up the search. It was enough to bring tears into the eyes of bearded men to hear the melancholy tone with which she inquired of every stranger whether he could tell her any news of the lost child. "'Have you seen a little girl? No, no. I mean a young maiden of full growth. Passing by this way, mounted on a snow-white bull, which gallops as swiftly as the wind?' "'We have seen no such wondrous sight,' the people would reply. And very often, taking Cadmus aside, they whispered to him, "'Is this stately and sad-looking woman your mother?' Surely she is not in her right mind, and you ought to take her home and make her comfortable, and do your best to get this dream out of her fancy. It is no dream, said Cadmus. Everything else is a dream, save that. But one day Telephassa seemed feebler than usual, and leaned almost her whole weight on the arm of Cadmus, and walked more slowly than ever before. At last they reached a solitary spot, where she told her son that she must needs lie down and take a good, long rest. A good, long rest, she repeated, looking Cadmus tenderly in the face. A good, long rest, thou dearest one. As long as you please, dear mother, answered Cadmus. Telephassa bade him sit down on the turf beside her, and then she took his hand. "'My son,' said she, fixing her dim eyes most lovingly upon him, "'this rest that I speak of will be very long indeed. "'You must not wait till it is finished. "'Dear Cadmus, you do not comprehend me. "'You must make a grave here and lay your mother's weary frame into it. "'My pilgrimage is over.' Cadmus burst into tears, and for a long time refused to believe that his dear mother was now to be taken from him. But Telephassa reasoned with him, and kissed him, and at length made him discern that it was better for her spirit to pass away out of the toil, the weariness, the grief, and disappointment which had burdened her on earth ever since the child was lost. He therefore repressed his sorrow, and listened to her last words. Dearest Cadmus, said she, thou hadst been the truest son that ever mother had, and faithful to the very last. Who else would have borne with my infirmities as thou hast? It is owing to thy care, thou tenderest child, that my grave was not dug long years ago, in some valley or on some hillside that lies far, far behind us. It is enough. Thou shalt wander no more on this hopeless search. But when thou hast laid thy mother in the earth, then go, my son, to Delphi, and inquire of the oracle what thou shalt do next. O oh, mother, mother, cried Cadmus, couldst thou but have seen my sister before this hour? It matters little now, answered Telephassa, and there was a smile upon her face. I go now to the better world, and, sooner or later, shall find my daughter there. I will not sadden you, my little hearers, with telling how Telephassa died and was buried, but will only say that her dying smile grew brighter instead of vanishing from her dead face so that Cadmus felt convinced that, at her very first step into the better world, she had caught Europa in her arms. He planted some flowers on his mother's grave, and left them to grow there, and make the place beautiful when he should be far away.
After performing this last sorrowful duty, he set forth alone and took the road toward the famous oracle of Delphi, as Telephassa had advised him. On his way thither, he still inquired of most people whom he had met whether they had seen Europa, for, to say the truth, Cadmus had grown so accustomed to ask the question that it came to his lips as readily as a remark about the weather. He received various answers. Some told him one thing and some another. Among the rest, a mariner affirmed that many years before, in a distant country, he had heard a rumor about a white bull, which came swimming across the sea with a child on his back dressed up in flowers that were blighted by the sea-water. He did not know what had become of the child or the bull, and Cadmus suspected, indeed, by a queer twinkle in the mariner's eyes, that he was putting a joke upon him, and had never really heard anything about the matter. Poor Cadmus found it more wearisome to travel alone than to bear all his dear mother's weight while he, she had kept him company. His heart, you will understand, was now so heavy that it seemed impossible sometimes to carry it any farther. But his limbs were strong and active and well accustomed to exercise. He walked swiftly along, thinking of King Agenor and Queen Telephassa, and his brothers, and the friendly Thassus, all of whom he had left behind him, at one point of his pilgrimage or another, and never expected to see them any more. Full of these remembrances, he came within sight of a lofty mountain, which the people thereabouts told him was called Parnassus. On the slope of Mount Parnassus was the famous Delphi, whither Cadmus was going. This Delphi was supposed to be the very midmost spot of the whole world. The place of the oracle was a certain cavity in the mountainside over which, when Cadmus came thither, he found a rude bower of branches. It reminded him of those which he had helped to build for Phoenix and Cilix, and afterward for Thassus. In later times, when multitudes of people came from great distances to put questions to the oracle, a spacious temple of marble was erected over the spot. But in the days of Cadmus, as I have told you, there was only this rustic bower with its abundance of green foliage and a tuft of shrubbery that ran wild over the mysterious hole in the hillside. When Cadmus had thrust a passage through the tangled boughs and made his way into the bower, he did not at first discern the half-hidden cavity, but soon he felt a cold stream of air rushing out of it, with so much force that it shook the ringlets on his cheek. Pulling away the shrubbery which clustered over the hole, he bent forward and spoke in a distinct but reverential tone, as if addressing some unseen personage inside of the mountain. "'Sacred Oracle of Delphi,' said he, Whither shall I go next in quest of my dear sister Europa? There was at first a deep silence, and then a rushing sound, or a noise like a long sigh proceeding out of the interior of the earth. This cavity, you must know, was looked upon as a sort of fountain of truth which sometimes gushed out in audible words, although for the most part these words were such a riddle that they might just as well have stayed at the bottom of the hole. But Cadmus was more fortunate than many others who went to Delphi in search of truth. By and by, the rushing noise began to sound like articulate language. It repeated over and over again the following sentence, which, after all, was so like the vague whistle of a blast of air that Cadmus really did not quite know whether it meant anything or not. Seek her no more! Seek her no more! Seek her no more! What then shall I do? asked Cadmus. For ever since he was a child, you know, it had been the great object of his life to find his sister. From the very hour that he left following the butterfly in the meadow near his father's palace, he had done his best to follow Europa over land and sea. And now, if he must give up the search, he seemed to have no more business in the world. But again the sighing gust of air grew into something like a hoarse voice. Follow the cow, it said. Follow the cow! Follow the cow! 
and when these words had been repeated until Cadmus was tired of hearing them, especially as he could not imagine what cow it was or why he was to follow her, the gusty hole gave vent to another sentence. Where the stray cow lies down, there is your home. These words were pronounced but a single time, and died away into a whisper before Cadmus was fully satisfied that he had caught the meaning. He put other questions, but received no answer. Only the gust of wind sighed continually out of the cavity, and blew the withered leaves rustling along the ground before it. Did there really come any words out of the hole? thought Cadmus. Or have I been dreaming all this while? He turned away from the oracle and thought himself no wiser than when he came thither. Caring little what might happen to him, he took the first path that offered itself, and went along at a sluggish pace. For, having no object in view, nor any reason to go one way more than another, it would certainly have been foolish to make haste. Whenever he met anybody, the old question was at his tongue's end. Have you seen a beautiful maiden, dressed like a king's daughter, and mounted on a snow-white bull that gallops as swiftly as the wind? But remembering what the oracle had said, he only half uttered the words, and then mumbled the rest indistinctly, and from his confusion people must have imagined that this handsome young man had lost his wits. I know not how far Cadmus had gone, nor could he himself have told you, when, at no great distance before him, he beheld a brindled cow. She was lying down by the wayside and quietly chewing her cud, nor did she take any notice of the young man until he had approached pretty nigh. Then, getting leisurely upon her feet and giving her head a gentle toss, she began to move along at a moderate pace, often pausing just long enough to crop a mouthful of grass. Cadmus loitered behind, whistling idly to himself and scarcely noticing the cow, until the thought occurred to him whether this could possibly be the animal which, according to the oracle's response, was to serve him for a guide. But he smiled at himself for fancying such a thing. He could not seriously think that this was the cow because she went along so quietly, behaving just like any other cow. Evidently she neither knew nor cared so much as a wisp of hay about Cadmus, and was only thinking how to get her living along the wayside, where the herbage was green and fresh. Perhaps she was going home to be milked. "'Cow! Cow! Cow!' cried Cadmus. "'Hey, Brindle! Hey! Stop, my good cow!' He wanted to come up with the cow so as to examine her and see if she would appear to know him, or whether there were any peculiarities to distinguish her from a thousand other cows whose only business is to fill the milk pail and sometimes kick it over. But still the brindled cow trudged on, whisking her tail to keep the flies away, and taking as little notice of Cadmus as she well could. If he walked slowly, so did the cow, and seized the opportunity to graze. If he quickened his pace, the cow went just so much the faster, and once, when Cadmus tried to catch her by running, she threw out her heels, stuck her tail straight on end, and set off at a gallop, looking as queerly as cows generally do while putting themselves to their speed. When Cadmus saw that it was impossible to come up with her, he walked on moderately as before. The cow, too, went leisurely on without looking behind. Wherever the grass was greenest, there she nibbled a mouthful or two. Where a brook glistened brightly across the path, there the cow drank and breathed a comfortable sigh, and drank again, and trudged onward at the pace that best suited herself and Cadmus. I do believe, thought Cadmus, that this may be the cow that was foretold me. If it be the one, I suppose she will lie down somewhere hereabouts. Whether it were the oracular cow or some other one, it did not seem reasonable that she should travel a great way farther. So, whenever they reached a particularly pleasant spot on a breezy hillside, or in a sheltered vale, or flowery meadow, or the shore of a calm lake, or along the bank of a clear stream, Cadmus looked eagerly around to see if the situation would suit him for a home. But still, whether he liked the place or no, the brindled cow never offered to lie down. On she went at the quiet pace of a cow going homeward to the barnyard. 
and every moment cadmus expected to see a milkmaid approaching with a pail or a herdsman running to head the stray animal or turn her back toward the pasture but no milkmaid came no herdsman drove her back and cadmus followed the stray brindle till he was almost ready to drop down with fatigue oh brindled cow cried he in a tone of despair do you never mean to stop he had now grown too intent on following her to think of lagging behind however long the way and whatever might be his fatigue indeed it seemed as if there were something about the animal that bewitched people several persons who happened to see the brindled cow and cadmus following behind began to trudge after her precisely as he did cadmus was glad of somebody to converse with and therefore talked very freely to these good people he told them all his adventures and how he had left king agenor in his palace and phoenix at one place and silix at another and thasus at a third and his dear mother queen telephassa under a flowery sod so that now he was quite alone both friendless and homeless he mentioned likewise that the oracle had bidden him be guided by a cow and inquired of the strangers whether they supposed that this brindled animal could be the one why tis a very wondrous affair answered one of his new companions i am pretty well acquainted with the ways of cattle and i never knew a cow of her own accord to go so far without stopping if my legs will let me i'll never leave following the beast till she lies down nor i said a second nor i cried a third if she goes a hundred miles farther i'm determined to see the end of it the secret of it was you must know that the cow was an enchanted cow and that without their being conscious of it she threw some of her enchantment over everybody that took so much as a half dozen steps behind her they could not possibly help following her though all the time they fancied themselves doing it of their own accord the cow was by no means very nice in choosing her path so that sometimes they had to scramble over rocks or wade through mud and mire and were all in a terribly bedraggled condition and tired to death and very hungry into the bargain what a weary business it was but still they kept trudging stoutly forward and talking as they went the strangers grew very fond of cadmus and resolved never to leave him but to help him build a city wherever the cow might lie down in the centre of it there should be a noble palace in which cadmus might dwell and be their king with a throne a crown and sceptre a purple robe and everything else that a king ought to have for in him there was the royal blood and the royal heart and the head that knew how to rule while they were talking of these schemes and beguiling the tediousness of the way with laying out the plan of the new city one of the company happened to look at the cow joy joy cried he clapping his hands brindle is going to lie down they all looked and sure enough the cow had stopped and was staring leisurely about her as other cows do when on the point of lying down and slowly slowly did she recline herself on the soft grass first bending her forelegs and then crouching her hind ones when cadmus and his companions came up with her there was the brindled cow taking her ease chewing her cud and looking them quietly in the face as if this was just the spot she had been seeking for and as if it were all a matter of course this then said cadmus gazing around him this is to be my home it was a fertile and lovely plain with great trees flinging their sun-speckled shadows over it and hills fencing it in from the rough weather at no great distance they beheld a river gleaming in the sunshine a home feeling stole into the heart of poor cadmus he was very glad to know that here he might awake in the morning without the necessity of putting on his dusty sandals to travel farther and farther the days and the years would pass over him and find him still in this pleasant spot if he could have had his brothers with him and his friend thasus and could have seen his dear mother under a roof of his own he might here have been happy after all their disappointments some day or other too his sister europa might have come quietly to the door of his home and smiled round upon the familiar faces 
But, indeed, since there was no hope of regaining the friends of his boyhood, or ever seeing his dear sister again, Cadmus resolved to make himself happy with these new companions, who had grown so fond of him while following the cow. "'Yes, my friends,' said he to them, "'this is to be our home. Here we will build our habitations. The brindled cow, which has led us hither, will supply us with milk.' We will cultivate the neighboring soil and lead an innocent and happy life. His companions joyfully assented to this plan, and in the first place, being very hungry and thirsty, they looked about them for the means of providing a comfortable meal. Not far off they saw a tuft of trees which appeared as if there might be a string of water beneath them. They went thither to fetch some, leaving Cadmus stretched on the ground along with the brindled cow. For, now that he had found a place of rest, it seemed as if all the weariness of his pilgrimage, ever since he left King Agenor's palace, had fallen upon him at once. But his new friends had not long been gone, when he was suddenly startled by cries, shouts, and screams, and the noise of a terrible struggle, and in the midst of it all, a most awful hissing, which went right through his ears like a rough saw. Running toward the tuft of trees, he beheld the head and fiery eyes of an immense serpent or dragon, with the widest jaws that ever a dragon had, and a vast many rows of horribly sharp teeth. Before Cadmus could reach the spot, this pitiless reptile had killed his poor companions, and was busily devouring them, making but a mouthful of each man. It appears that the fountain of water was enchanted, and that the dragon had been set to guard it, so that no mortal might ever quench his thirst there. As the neighboring inhabitants carefully avoided the spot, it was now a long time, not less than a hundred years or thereabouts, since the monster had broken his fast. And, as was natural enough, his appetite had grown to be enormous, and was not half satisfied by the poor people whom he had just eaten up. When he caught sight of Cadmus, therefore, he set up another abominable hiss, and flung back his immense jaws until his mouth looked like a great red cavern, at the farther end of which were seen the legs of his last victim, whom he had hardly had time to swallow. But Cadmus was so enraged at the destruction of his friends that he cared neither for the size of the dragon's jaws nor for his hundreds of sharp teeth. Drawing his sword, he rushed at the monster and flung himself right into his cavernous mouth. This bold method of attacking him took the dragon by surprise, for in fact Cadmus had leaped so far down into his throat that the rows of terrible teeth could not close upon him nor do him the least harm in the world. Thus, though the struggle was a tremendous one, and though the dragon shattered the tuft of trees into small splinters by the lashing of his tail, yet, as Cadmus was all the while slashing and stabbing at his very vitals, and it was not long before the scaly wretch bethought himself of slipping away. He had not gone his length, however, when the brave Cadmus gave him a sword thrust that finished the battle. And, creeping out of the gateway of the creature's jaws, there he beheld him still wriggling in his vast bulk, although there was no longer life enough in him to harm a little child. But do you suppose that it made Cadmus sorrowful to think of the melancholy fate which had befallen those poor, friendly people who had followed the cow along with him? It seemed as if he were doomed to lose everybody whom he loved, or to see them perish in one way or another. And here he was, after all his toils and troubles, in a solitary place, with not a single human being to help him build a hut. "'What shall I do?' cried he aloud. "'It were better for me to have been devoured by the dragon, as my poor companions were.' "'Cadmus,' said a voice, but whether it came from above or below him, or whether it spoke within his own breast, the young man could not tell. "'Cadmus,' Pluck out the dragon's teeth, and plant them in the earth. This was a strange thing to do, nor was it very easy, I should imagine, to dig out all those deep-rooted fangs from the dead dragon's jaws. But Cadmus toiled and tugged, and after pounding the monstrous head almost to pieces with a great stone, he at last collected as many teeth as might have filled a bushel or two. The next thing was to plant them. This, likewise, was a tedious piece of work, 
especially as Cadmus was already exhausted with killing the dragon and knocking his head to pieces, and had nothing to dig the earth with, that I know of unless it were his sword-blade. Finally, however, a sufficiently large tract of ground was turned up, and sown with this new kind of seed, although half of the dragon's teeth still remained to be planted some other day. Cadmus, quite out of breath, stood leaning upon his sword, and wondering what was to happen next. He had waited but a few moments when he began to see a sight which was as great a marvel as the most marvelous thing I ever told you about. The sun was shining slantwise over the field, and showed all the moist dark soil just like any other newly planted piece of ground. All at once Cadmus fancied he saw something glisten very brightly, first at one spot, then at another, then at a hundred and a thousand spots together. Soon he perceived them to be the steel heads of spears, sprouting up everywhere like so many stalks of grain, and continually growing taller and taller. Next appeared a vast number of bright sword blades, thrusting themselves up in the same way. A moment afterward, the whole surface of the ground was broken up by a multitude of polished brass helmets, coming up like a crop of enormous beans. So rapidly did they grow that Cadmus now discerned the fierce countenance of a man beneath every one. In short, before he had time to think what a wonderful affair it was, he beheld an abundant harvest of what looked like human beings, armed with helmets and breastplates, shields, swords, and spears. And before they were well out of the earth, they brandished their weapons and clashed them one against another, seeming to think, little while as they had yet lived, that they had wasted too much of life without a battle. Every tooth of the dragon had produced one of these sons of deadly mischief. Up sprouted also a great many trumpeters, and with the first breath that they drew they put their brazen trumpets to their lips, and sounded a tremendous and ear-shattering blast, so that the whole space, just now so quiet and solitary, reverberated with the clash and clang of arms, the bray of warlike music, and the shouts of angry men. So enraged did they all look that Cadmus fully expected them to put the whole world to the sword. How fortunate would it be for a great conqueror if they could get a bushel of the dragon's teeth to sow! Cadmus, said the same voice which he had before heard, throw a stone into the midst of the armed men. So Cadmus seized a large stone, and flinging it into the middle of the earth army, saw it strike the breastplate of a gigantic and fierce-looking warrior. Immediately on feeling the blow, he seemed to take it for granted that somebody had struck him, and, uplifting his weapon, he smote his next neighbor a blow that cleft his helmet asunder and stretched him on the ground. In an instant, those nearest the fallen warrior began to strike at each other with their swords and stab with their spears. The confusion spread wider and wider. Each man smote down his brother and was himself smitten down before he had time to exult in his victory. The trumpeters all the while blew their blasts shriller and shriller. Each soldier shouted a battle cry and often fell with it on his lips. It was the strangest spectacle of causeless wrath and of mischief for no good end that had ever been witnessed. But, after all, it was neither more foolish nor more wicked than a thousand battles that have since been fought, in which men have slain their brothers with just as little reason as these children of the dragon's teeth. It ought to be considered, too, that the dragon people were made for nothing else, whereas other mortals were born to love and help one another. Well, this memorable battle continued to rage until the ground was strewn with helmeted heads that had been cut off. Of all the thousands that began the fight, there were only five left standing. These now rushed from different parts of the field, and meeting in the middle of it, clashed their swords, and struck at each other's hearts as fiercely as ever. Cadmus, said the voice again, bid those five warriors to sheathe their swords. They will help you to build the city. Without hesitating an instant, Cadmus stepped forward with the aspect of a king and a leader, and extending his drawn sword among them, spoke to the warriors in a stern and commanding voice. "'Sheathe your weapons,' said he. 
and forthwith feeling themselves bound to obey him, the five remaining sons of the dragon's teeth made him a military salute with their swords, returned them to the scabbards, and stood before Cadmus in a rank, eyeing him as soldiers eye their captain, while awaiting the word of command. These five men had probably strung from the biggest of the dragon's teeth, and were the boldest and strongest of the whole army. They were almost giants indeed, and had good need to be so, else they never could have lived through so terrible a fight. They still had a very furious look, and if Cadmus happened to glance aside, would glare at one another with fire flashing out of their eyes. It was strange, too, to observe how the earth out of which they had so lately grown was encrusted, here and there on their bright breastplates, and even begrimed their faces, just as you may have seen it clinging to beets and carrots when pulled out of their native soil. Cadmus hardly knew whether to consider them as men or some odd kind of vegetable. Although, on the whole, he concluded that there was human nature in them, because they were so fond of trumpets and weapons, and so ready to shed blood. They looked him earnestly in the face, waiting for his next order, and evidently desiring no other employment than to follow him from one battlefield to another, all over the wide world. But Cadmus was wiser than these earth-born creatures, with the dragon's fierceness in them, and knew better how to use their strength and hardihood. Come, said he, you are sturdy fellows. Make yourselves useful. Quarry some stones with those great swords of yours, and help me to build a city. The five soldiers grumbled a little, and muttered that it was their business to overthrow cities, not to build them up. But Cadmus looked at them with a stern eye, and spoke to them in a tone of authority, so that they knew him for their master, and never again thought of disobeying his commands. They set to work in good earnest, and toiled so diligently that, in a very short time, a city began to make its appearance. At first, to be sure, the workmen showed a quarrelsome disposition. Like savage beasts, they would doubtless have done one another a mischief if Cadmus had not kept watch over them and quelled the fierce old serpent that lurked in their hearts when he saw it gleaming out of their wild eyes. But in the course of time they got accustomed to honest labor, and had sense enough to feel that there was more true enjoyment in living at peace and doing good to one's neighbor than in striking at him with a two-edged sword. It may not be too much to hope that the rest of mankind will by and by grow as wise and peaceable as these five earth-begrimed warriors who sprang from the dragon's teeth. And now that the city was built, and there was a home in it for each of the workmen, but the palace of Cadmus was not yet erected, because they had left it till the last, meaning to introduce all the new improvements of architecture and make it very commodious as well as stately and beautiful. After finishing the rest of their labors, they all went to bed betimes, in order to rise in the gray of the morning, and get at least the foundation of the edifice laid before nightfall. But when Cadmus arose, and took his way toward the site where the palace was to be built, followed by his five sturdy workmen marching all in a row, what do you think he saw? What should it be but the most magnificent palace that had ever been seen in the world? It was built of marble and other beautiful kinds of stone, and rose high in the air, with a splendid dome and a portico along the front, and carved pillars, and everything else that befitted the habitation of a mighty king. It had grown up out of the earth in almost as short a time as it had taken the armed host to spring from the dragon's teeth, and what made the matter more strange, no seed of this stately edifice had ever been planted." When the five workmen beheld the dome with the morning sunshine making it look golden and glorious, they gave a great shout. Long live King Cadmus, they cried, in his beautiful palace. And the new king, with his five faithful followers at his heels, shouldering their pickaxes and marching in a rank, for they still had a soldier-like sort of behavior as their nature was, ascended the palace steps. Halting at the entrance, they gazed through a long vista of lofty pillars that were ranged from end to end of a great hall. At the farther extremity of this hall, approaching slowly toward him, 
Cadmus beheld a female figure, wonderfully beautiful, and adorned with a royal robe, and a crown of diamonds over her golden ringlets, and the richest necklace that ever a queen wore. His heart thrilled with delight. He fancied it his long-lost sister Europa, now grown to womanhood, coming to make him happy and to repay him with her sweet sisterly affection for all those weary wanderings in quest of her since he left King Agenor's palace, for the tears that he had shed on parting with Phoenix and Cilix and Thassus, for the heartbreakings that had made the whole world seem dismal to him over his dear mother's grave. But as Cadmus advanced to meet the beautiful stranger, he saw that her features were unknown to him, although in the little time that it required to tread along the hall, he had already felt a sympathy betwixt himself and her. No, Cadmus, said the same voice that had spoken to him in the field of the armed men, this is not the dear sister Europa whom you have sought so faithfully all over the wide world. This is Harmonia, a daughter of the sky, who has given you instead of sister, and brothers, and friend, and mother. You will find all those dear ones in her alone. So Cadmus dwelt in the palace with his new friend Harmonia, and found a great deal of comfort in his magnificent abode, but would doubtless have found as much, if not more, in the humblest cottage by the wayside. Before many years went by, there was a group of rosy little children, but how they came thither has always been a mystery to me, sporting in the great hall and on the marble steps of the palace, and running joyfully to meet King Cadmus when affairs of state left him at leisure to play with them. They called him father, and Queen Harmonia mother. The five old soldiers of the dragon's teeth grew very fond of these small urchins, and were never weary of showing them how to shoulder sticks, flourish wooden swords, and march in military order, blowing a penny trumpet, or beating an abominable rub-a-dub upon a little drum. But King Cadmus, lest there should be too much of the dragon's tooth in his children's disposition, used to find time from his kingly duties to teach them their ABC, which he invented for their benefit and for which many little people, I am afraid, are not half so grateful to him as they ought to be. End of section 12. Recording by Tom Geller, Oberlin, Ohio, tomgeller.com.